cloud. <laughs> I believe we're recording. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Space Time Mind. I'm your host, Pete Mandic, and I'm thrilled and not exaggerating to say that I'm thrilled to be speaking to Jacob Berger. Professor Berger is assistant professor of philosophy at Lycoming College in Pennsylvania. How am I doing on accuracy and pronunciation so far? Sounds good to me. Uh, and Jake is um, a researcher in philosophy of mind and cognitive science, has published numerous articles about consciousness, perception, the unconscious, color, and other things besides. Also, you are uh, at least um, twice now, you've co-authored with Richard Brown. Yep. I have co-authored with Richard Brown. And so I think you and I should probably co-author something to complete the, the circle. I'm in. But Maybe something will come right. up today. Yeah. Turn into a paper. Um, <laughs> so anyway, you know, people that know you probably know you as a higher order thought theory of consciousness guy. And people that really know you know that you're part of the hot army, <laughs> a group of a group of philosophers who came out of the CUNY Graduate Center, worked either directly or indirectly with David Rosenthal, who's, you know, known as I, he's not is I mean, he's like the main ambassador of hot theory. In my mind, the best articulator of the hot theory. Does he deserve credit for inventing or discovering hot theory? Or do, is that one of those things where it's it's hard to say who came up with it first? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, maybe his version of it, like um, like higher order thought theory, like a current higher order thought theory. I mean, there's definitely higher order theorists before David, like arguably Armstrong and Locke. Um, but yeah, right. the thinking that the mechanism is a thought and a current thought guess I would say that's David's view. Yeah. That he originated it. I think the, <clears throat> for my money, the hot theory, which by the way, I don't, I am not a hot theorist. I nonetheless love it. You know, I think there's this Alex Byrne quote from uh, this paper, Alex Byrne wrote about the hot theory. I forgot the title of it, but it's something like, like it hot. maybe it's the some like it hot paper. It, and he says something like um, towards the end, it's like the only theory of consciousness he understands, which is, and he, and he feels bad that he had to refute it. <laughs> something yeah, like good. that. I'm, I'm not doing justice to the quote, it's, but anyways, it's, I'm it's a, it's failure or something like that. I think I feel like there's like, yeah. <clears throat> you know, in conscious, the consciousness studies literature, there's a lot of baloney out there. Um, and I think of the hot theory is a no baloney zone. I really respect the way in which, the proponents of hot theory are very clear, really respect arguments, really respect trying to state clearly what, what, what's going on, what this is all about. So what I was hoping that, that we could do today in our discussion is start with hot theory, get you to, to say what your understanding of it is. Um, you know, another thing that hangs together with all this is stuff about thinking of, uh, about quality spaces, thinking of, for example, the perception or sensation of color in terms of something called a quality quality space. And then also you've done work on the metaphysics of color. And, and if we have time, maybe we could go outside of the mind and talk about what colors are, but who knows it's, you know, it's easy for these topics to just gobble up lots and lots of time, but would you like to jump into some, some hot theory? Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. And I just want to say, like, I think that that's, one of the reasons why I'm really drawn to the theory too is that I do think that it the theory at least attempts to be a theory. It attempts to articulate, you know, how consciousness is supposed to work, and it's supposed to start with it's supposed to be giving an informative, illuminating account of how consciousness works. I mean, I've been writing a lot of papers about it lately. Um, I've got even a couple of other papers I'm working on right now. And so, <clears throat> whether or not it's extremely clear what hot theory says, I think that's debatable. Like I'm, I, I still feel like as I'm thinking through, like I clarify how I understand the view more and more. Um, but yeah, but in a nutshell, I think higher order views in general start with like the observation that mentality can occur unconsciously. That's a sort of starting point. <clears throat> so states like beliefs, desires, hopes, fears, doubts, perceptual states, 
even, you know, states that are allegedly qualitative, like emotional states, that these can all occur unconsciously. <clears throat> and then sort of the motivation for higher order views in general is, is what David Rosenthal has called the transitivity principle, which is the idea that sort of naturally to describe those states is that if you're in, in one of those states, but you're not in any way aware that you're in that state, then that state isn't conscious, right? Um, in whatever sense of conscious, you know, people want to say, but, and actually that's, that's something that I've been working on, which is, um, at least a lot in, in, in Rosenthal's early work, he just says, you know, it's not conscious and, and doesn't say like, it's not phenomenally conscious or there's, you know, doesn't say anything about um, what it's like or those kinds of terms that people toss around. But I think that you can, you know, frame it in those terms too. So if you're in a state, but you're in no way aware that you're in that state, then there's nothing that it's like to be in that state, right? There's no phenomenal consciousness. Um, so what is it to be? So, but that's just equivalent to the claim that a mental state's conscious like only if you're somehow aware of being in that state. Um, and that's that's what David calls the transitivity principle. And it's what I think guides, it's what guides, you know, my theorizing and higher thought theorists theorizing about what consciousness is. That just tells you sort of like in a comment, supposed to be in a pre-theoretical way, what consciousness is. And now we're supposed to start theorizing. Like that's not supposed to be theoretical. That's supposed to be just like our common sense grip on what consciousness is. Um, and then there, the door is open now to start giving a theory. And in Rosenthal's work, which you know obviously guides a lot of my thinking about these things, um, we need a mechanism that's supposed to explain what it, what you know, how is it that we're aware of our mental states such that they're conscious. And on the higher order thought theory, that mechanism is a cer certain kind of suitable ordinary thought and a current thought, like a, a thought like you know I think that I'm you know I think I'm seeing red. Um, so I see red as the content of a hot. And if you have a suitable higher order thought, so like the right kind of higher order thought, because not anyone will do, um, but you have a suitable one, that's just what it is to be in a conscious state of seeing red, is to be is to have the thought that you're seeing red. That's so, the theory in a nutshell. One of the things I love about <clears throat> the theory is the the comeback it has when people say that it's unintuitive or it doesn't match up with their introspection, because. Uh, when I talk to people about this, a lot of times I, I encounter this immediate dismissal. Yeah. And when I push people about it, they dis it seems like their main basis for dismissing it is that, well, I mean, introspectively, that seems not to be what's going on. Or they might not base it in introspection, just pre claim that pre theoretically that seems too elaborate. And the, the hot theory, at least as I know it through, Rosenthal and the and the the hot army has a really great comeback, which is that well, I mean, the only way it would seem that way to you is if you had a third order thought that you know had as its content something like well, there's this second order mental state directed at a first order mental state, but in the presumably typical case of consciousness, where for example, you, the first order state is like seeing red. Yeah, seeing that the pillow on your couch is reddish. Um, the higher order thought is not or need not be conscious. Right. It's in virtue of that higher order thought, having the content that it has, that it consciously seems to you that there's a reddish pillow on the couch. But it doesn't have to seem to you that you have a higher order thought, that you have a higher order thought is something that maybe we get at theoretically or under special circumstances, you can have introspective access to it. But I just think that's just such a sweet move. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, like, I mean, exactly. Like you wouldn't be typically aware that you're in these thoughts because the thoughts are themselves not conscious. They're what makes a first order state conscious or what makes you aware of being in a first order state, but you're not aware that you're in the state of awareness. Um, at least in the ordinary case. I mean, I also think in response to the idea that the view is unintuitive, I mean, <clears throat> or like not common sense or whatever, like the motivation for it is supposed to be grounded in common sense. The, the transitivity principle is supposed to be coming at um, what consciousness is in a way that like everyone's supposed to agree with. Like if you're in a state, like, if, you know, I put you in a, you know, experimental setup and, <clears throat> you know, mask a stimulus and you report that you don't see the stimulus, but we've got reason to think that you subliminally saw it seems like a natural way to describe what's going on is you're the reason why what it is for that state to be you know unconscious is you're not in any way aware that you're in that state um but that's just equivalent to the claim that the state would be conscious only if you're somehow aware of being in it um 
another another thing that is really attractive about the higher order thought theory of consciousness is that it's pitched at a level or in a vocabulary that um, straddles a lot of really useful lines to straddle. So one of them is the first person, third person distinction. A another is the theoretical and common sense distinction, right? So uh, about the first person versus third person, our common sense mentalistic vocabulary of, for example, talking about people having thoughts, th these are things that we're all adept at, you know, past age, I don't know, two or five or something like that. We're all adept at first person or self attribution, but also third person attribution, right? We're, we have a pretty good handle on being able to tell things like, well, the dog is thirsty, or I think Jake is not really thinking about what's going on here and now he seems a little distracted that i just made that up he seems perfectly non-distracted ladies and gentlemen <laughs> um, uh, but the, i think that you know the higher order thought theory in talking about thoughts and relating that to this locution of conscious of uh, and related things like aware of really helps show that we do have a third person handle on consciousness and a lot of the consciousness studies literature is hyper-focused on the first person, I think, and you probably would agree with me to the point of just overly <clears> fetishizing <throat> it and, and not being able to give any account of the, the third person life that these concepts uh, live, but also to remark on straddling the, the theoretical versus commonsensical distinction. It is part of at least English, I, I don't know about other languages that, that you have this construction where you could talk about people being conscious of things and you could relate it in a very natural way to thinking about things or having thoughts of things. And then from there, it's only you know, a short step to what looks more theoretical, like, for example, talking about representations, re relating this maybe to a naturalistic account where you're giving an account of representations in a way that would be satisfying from a naturalistic or physicalistic point of view. So I, I, I think those are the things that make it a super appealing and useful theory. And even if you don't fully agree with it, I still think there's nice chunks that you could, you could take away from it uh, without fully endorsing it. One thing I wanted to come back to that you mentioned uh, early <clears throat> on is what arguably are competing ways of thinking about consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, I, so one of them is this transitivity principle thing um, and correct me if I'm wrong I, I think of it as uh, a, a conscious state is a state of which one is conscious is that a pretty fair way of stating the, con uh, the transitivity principle or well so I think that yeah I mean <clears throat> or am I getting like... in trouble already well, I mean, you know, it depends on how technical you want to get. I, I, I actually think it matters a lot about what the right way to say the transitivity principle is. And I think that like, there are sort of increasingly, um, sorry, I'm getting a message on my computer. Sorry about that. Um, I think there are like kind of shorthand ways of putting it. So I think that's a perfectly fine shorthand way of putting it. I do think that um, if we focus on that way of reading the TP, it can actually get you into some trouble, like, you know, maybe with like so-called empty hot bodies and so forth. And so I think that the more careful way of spelling out the, t the transitivity principle is that one is in a conscious state when one is aware of being in that in a, in a state or, you know, a conscious state is a state that one is aware of oneself as being in. So it's making the awareness targeting the self and as being in a state, as opposed to a conscious state is a state you're aware of, because that makes the state look like the thing the principal thing you're aware of. I, I predict we're going to come back to that. So we can maybe come back to that. So there's a kind of like, yeah, so, it, but maybe that's more detail than is necessary at, the, at this stage, but yeah. Yeah, that's at like, least for now. For now, yeah. But yeah, I think we probably will come back to it because I, I'm at, I actually find pretty convincing a lot of the empty higher thought style objections. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll be coming back to that. But for now, uh, I, I'll get away with just saying like, it's a state one is conscious of. Sure. Because mostly what I want to do is contrast that with a characterization of consciousness that's explicitly in terms of the so-called what it's like locutions. Sure. So, for example, if you look at Nagel's 
1974, what is it like to be a bat article, you get this very explicit statement of what a conscious state is supposed to be. And I'm probably going to botch the wording because I'm not reading the paper right now. But the wording is something like a, a, a conscious state is a state such that there's something it's like to be in it. Whatever the heck that means, but that's pretty much the phraseology. Uh, on the one hand, you've got this Nagel way of identifying conscious states in terms of something derived from the what it's like locution. Specifically, it's something it's like. And on the other hand, you've got what's attractive to the higher order thought crowd, which is a state of which one is conscious. Yeah. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, it, it, as we'll probably get into it in a little bit, there's ways of pulling these apart. Um, especially when we get into the truth or falsity of the higher order thoughts in various situations or uh, really radical situations where, as we might say, the thought is empty in the sense that it's, it's not simply mischaracterizing a thing. It's erroneously saying there's a thing there to be characterized. Um, and so what to say about phenomenal consciousness relative to that becomes vexing. But maybe just since we're easing into the, the water, you could say a little bit about how what it's likeness or phenomenal consciousness <laughs> is, uh, is supposed to fit into this, at least yeah. as, on your view of it. Yeah, so like <clears throat> one thing that, and Richard Brown here is really, um, as you mentioned, we, we wrote some papers together and he's really like influenced my thinking on this a lot, but I think that there's, there's definitely a way in which the higher theorist doesn't have to to eschew or see that kind of alternative what it's like talk as being, um, you know, like something that we have to reject or not a way to characterize consciousness, but it just can fit with the transitivity principle in the way that <clears throat> higher order theorists prefer or more typically like kind of ease into understanding what consciousness is in the first place. I mean, one little note that I'd make is, you know, I, I also don't have the Nagel paper in front of me, but I know this is a point that um, I think that Rosenthal has made, <clears throat> and uh, I think Richard makes this point too, that um, I think Nagel actually never talks about conscious states and the state being the thing in virtue of which there's what it's like. Rather, he says that what a con like an experience is a state it is one where there's something that it's like for the organism, um, which makes it seem like what it's likeness is more is, is a property of an, an individual <clears throat> um, as opposed to a state or it doesn't have to be keyed to a, a particular state. And I think that, that that may be important, that that's kind of potentially important for diffusing. I'm prepared to bet money about this. I'm, I'm no. pretty sure there's a biconditional, like he, he whips out like some pseudo logic <clears throat> kind of early in the, in the, that paper and he and and on the left side of the biconditional is uh the phrase conscious state so it's it really is something uh i don't know you know i wouldn't bet millions and not just because i don't have millions to bet but i'm pretty confident that that you can find in the nagel a formulation of state consciousness and it's something like uh, a state is conscious if and only if and then I'm a little foggy on what comes onto the right side of the biconditional, um, but it's either something like um, there's something it's like to be in that state, or it might use uh, that phrase plus also some something about in virtue of, right? So it's a state in virtue of which there's something it's like to be in that state. Uh, or, or the, in virtue of which there's something it's like for the organism, but I'm pretty sure on the left side you do get state, a state, a conscious state, which yeah. is interesting because then it allows you to set up Nagel versus the the, the hot crowd, and then there's a yeah. third a third party you can bring in to make the distinction into a, a tristinction, and you you get in you certain formulations from first order theorists, I think. You can find Dretzky saying stuff like a, a conscious state is a state one is conscious with and explicit denials that it's a state one is conscious of. So at least there's, there's, a, there's a period, I think, in the 90s where Dretzky is specifically going after what looks like a transitivity principle kind of formulation. Yeah. Um, 
So you can get from the literature, like these three different ways of trying to characterize state consciousness and then pit them against each other in fun and exciting ways. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one way to think about at least the, the Nagel stuff be, as being in tension with the higher order stuff is, um, I think going to get us into questions about like empty higher order thoughts. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then other questions about like, should we think, should we think of the higher order thought theory as a relational theory in, in mm. the sense that um, there's some first order state that can become conscious in virtue of there being a relation that it bears to a, a higher order state, or uh, whether instead we should think of the higher order theory as non-relational, at least in the sense that the higher order thought alone suffices. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, all, all of these various formulations can be thought of as relational in the sense that <laughs> they would be denying intrinsicality. You know, they'd be denying certain views of qualia as, you know, like immune to functionalization. Right. Uh, so it's going to be relational in that kind of broad sense that maybe a functionalist would be happy with. But there yeah. is this interesting contrast in the literature between interpret interpreting higher theory as like this um, relational situation where the first order thing gets a relational or enters into a relational, uh, it enters into a relation with the higher order thought and thereby is conscious. That's the relational reading. And then readings whereby the higher order thought alone suffices is what I'm calling the non-relational reading. Um, and it seems like the what I think of as the 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 Rosenthalians, the people directly under the influence of, of Ro Rosenthal, all go for that non-relational reading. Does yeah. that seem correct? Um, that I mean, not I'm not asking you is the non-relational reading correct, but would you agree with the sociological statement that the Rosenthalians all seem to agree with the, <laughs> um, the non-relational I mean, I reading? There's a handful, you know, there's a, a bunch of us who, have, you know, work closely with David and who are influ highly influenced by his thinking that are non-relational theorists. So I would definitely put myself oh. in that camp. Okay. Um, but I think there are people who have been inspired by David's work who endorse relational versions of higher order views. Um, you know, Rocco Gennaro um, is like one example. Oh um, uh, yeah, I don't count him as a Rosenthalian. I, I think I, like a Rosenthalian, you have to have literally physically been in his at, at the cuny grad center a whole bunch of times um, um and so definitely that would uh, in my mind be you and josh josh weisberg yeah. and richard brown yeah probably a few others besides i might even count as one if i actually agreed with the theory i think right. I've, I've i've been in your vicinity enough times yeah uh so well, it is the correct one. And so, you know, you got to study with, uh, with, with David to, to, to hear the real story. I, I don't know if that's necessary, um, but, but, I, but I do think, I mean, you said uh, setting a prescinding from whether it's the, the right reading. I do think that is the right reading and it is the right reading if you focus on thinking, of, like I think if you read the transitivity principle in the right way. Um, so that gets, connects to the point I was making before that you have to be sort of careful about what the right reading and what's the right lesson to take away from the transitivity principle. So um, here's the scenario that often gets discussed in these like empty, hot, hot sort of things. Um, so I have a higher thought whose content <laughs> is something along the lines of um, I, Pete Mandic, uh, have, uh, a, a, I'm seeing a green square. Right. And um, further, but just by some, just a weird, whatever. I'm actually not seeing a green square. I have a higher thought that I'm in such a first order state, but I'm not in any such first order state. Maybe I'm not in any visual state at all. Um, maybe I'm in a visual state, but none of the visual states I'm in has anything to do with see, seeing any squares or seeing anything as being green. So it's an empty higher thought. It, it would be like, um, if I were to believe that the rhinoceros in the room behind you was playing the tambourine. There's no rhinoceros behind <laughs> you. No one's playing the tambourine behind you. So that'd be a, 
not just false belief, but it's like subject term doesn't refer, uh, non-referring. Um, it, it, it's hard to know how much philosophy of language to get into when you're trying to deal with these philosophy of mind things. Yeah. But the, but that's the general picture of what a empty higher or thought is supposed to be. Yeah. And some people have said like, okay, you higher or thought theorists in this empty case, there's no first order state. So what do you say about this? Like, so for example, you could ask questions about what it's like. What is it like to be you when you have this so-called higher order uh, empty thought and it's uh, this empty higher order thought is very tempting to saying that what it's like to be you in the empty case is exactly what it's like to be you <clears throat> in in the so-called non-empty case where you've got the same higher order thought but it is accurately representing my first order situation yeah um what it's like to be me is the same and now yeah. this looks like it's on the edge of being a paradox or a contradiction if there's no first order state, um, then, then uh, what it's like, like, but there's still something it's like, if there's something it's like, what is the state in virtue of which there's something it's like, it's, it's tempting to say it's the higher thought, right? That's the state in virtue of which there's something it's like that the high, higher thought alone suffices for me to have the what it's likeness. And this is how I read Richard's read on all this stuff that with respect to, if you want to use phenomenal consciousness to track this like Nagelian, what it's like stuff, yeah. then it's the higher order thought that is the bearer of that phenomenality. Yeah. Um, but there's no first order state. So there's nothing that has state consciousness. So it looks like, I don't know what to say about this. Like one, there's, some people have tried to describe this whereby higher thought theory is just stuck with a full on contradiction. Yeah. There's another way of describing this stuff where y'all aren't saddled with a contradiction, but you nonetheless have this kind of maybe slightly awkward situation whereby um, your theory is not really about phenomenal consciousness. And that's what all that's supposed to be the real target, right? It, St. Chalmers has taught us that that's like what, what you're supposed to solve for when you're solving for the hard problem is phenomenal consciousness. And then you hire thought people. Ah, we knew it. Bait and switch. You weren't talking about phenomenal consciousness after all. You're talking about this other thing, call it introspective consciousness or reflective consciousness or, or what have you. It's right. not phenomenal consciousness. Um, so anyway, I forgot where this is all going, except to just, uh, try to prompt you to to say something about what well, like, well, seems yeah. like a nest of problems here. Yeah, so there's a lot of problems. I mean, so maybe maybe it'd be good to be back up and just say exactly about how I think that we should think about the original motivation for the theory for higher theories in general, which is so I don't think that a conscious state is a state that you're aware of. So putting it that way makes it seem like there's got to be a first order state. It seems like it's mandatory that we have a what you're calling a relational view of higher order awareness. So you need to have an actually existing state of higher order awareness, an actually existing first order state, and somehow the higher order state like kisses the first order state and makes it conscious, right? Um, and I don't think that that's a good way to think about like intentionality generally. Um, and that's why I, actually I prefer to almost get rid of awareness talk if we can. I mean, we can use awareness talk if we're careful, but like maybe instead just talk about like, seeming like so. I think that if you're in a state and it doesn't seem to you that you're in any way in that state, then that state's not conscious. So what is it to be in a conscious state is for it to seem to you suitably that you're in that state. So what a conscious state is, you know, I think if you're being careful about thinking about the, the central insight of the transitivity principle is that conscious states are apparent states. They're states that seems to you that you're in. They're states that, of appearance. Um, they're not the states in virtue of which it appears to you that you're some way, but that the states that appears to you that you're in. Okay, and once we use this appearance talk, which is, you know, Rosenthal has, you know, he has this kind of slogan that he has in a lot of papers where he says things like consciousness is a matter of mental appearance. I think that that hammers home this kind of central insight that our theories of consciousness are supposed to capture that conscious states are not, they don't need to be real things. They're things that appear to us in a certain way. Okay, so that what does this say about empty hots or, you know, empty higher thought situations? Um, 
look in the same so just think pretend we're the first order theorist about perception you know perceptual experience um it can seem to me that there's a red square when there's no red square um and it would seem to me that there's a red square in, in the same way uh whether or not there were a red square there okay so let's stop being first order theorists for a second now let's move let's be higher order theorists so we can say the same thing about our minds it can seem to you that you're in a state whether or not that state is present now in the typical case like when you're actually you know typically consciously seeing the world around you probably you, the states that it seems to you that you're in you're also in those states but I guess there could be these rare cases, or at least it's consistent with the theory that there could be these rare cases where it seems to you that you're in a state that, as you described, there isn't any first order state corresponding to it. And yeah, so I think it's the right thing to say that in that case, because of the nature of you know, intentionality, the way intentionality works, um, it would be for you the same way uh, whether the states, the first order state is present or not. So I think that like when you're like really focusing on like the appropriate motivation for the theory and the way to, way to understand what the theory is trying to capture, <clears throat> these kinds of worries about higher order misrepresentation like don't really, they don't even really get off the ground. There are some questions though, I mean, what should we say about what it's like and um, you know, what state is it in virtue of, or what state is the conscious state or what state um, is it in virtue of which there's something that it's like. And there, here I think we also have to be somewhat delicate. So I know that, you know, Richard Brown in his work has argued that it's the it's the higher order state that's conscious, um, or the higher order state that's phenomenally conscious. It's not so. One reason why I'm and Richard and I have argued about this a lot. Like one reason why I'm reluctant to go that route is that that then seems to separate phenomenal consciousness and state consciousness. So right, right, on, right. on Richard's view, you've got a state that's phenomenally conscious, but it's not state conscious because you're not aware of being in it. Right. And I don't like that. Um, I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to separate those. Maybe, so I think Rosenthal would be maybe okay with uh, separating those because he doesn't think that phenomenal consciousness is a good way to talk, you know, to begin with. I think that, you know, um, I don't, don't want to speak too much for, for, for Rosenthal, but my understanding of his view is that he thinks that like notions like phenomenal consciousness like beg a lot of questions. Um, for, for example, in particular, the notion seems to run together state consciousness and qualitative character, which Rosenthal wants to separate. We can talk about that in a little bit if you like. Um, but actually, my, my view is not 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 to separate state and phenomenal consciousness the way that Richard does, nor to deny that you know to prioritize one and deny the other, which is I take it kind of closer to what Rosenthal does. But rather, my view is I, I want to retain that they coincide. And so, I, and my thinking has on this has sort of shifted around. So I had a paper from several years ago where one move that I made was I said that we should stop thinking of the thing that's predicated by conscious as the state, the first order state. Um, and instead, what we should think is it's it really it's properly speaking, it's individuals that are phenomenally or state conscious. Um, so my thinking in that old paper was this is a paper from Phil Syke in 2014, I think. Um, so I say like uh, the right way to read the TP is that if you're in a mental if if it seems to you if sorry if you're in a mental state but it doesn't seem to you that you're in that mental state then that mental state is not conscious but that's equivalent to an organism is phenomenally conscious, or an organism, an individual is state conscious, if the organism is aware of itself as being in a mental state. And so properly speaking, what's phenomenally conscious or state conscious isn't a first order state because that needn't exist, but rather it's the, it's the it's a property of the individual. Um, and the individual is always present whenever there's something that it's like. Yeah, so there's something that it's like for the individual, and that's why I kind of like wanted to. Well, I'm hoping that I'm going to go back to my Nagel after uh, after this uh, chat. Um, that that the formulation can be put in terms of not talking about conscious states, but rather talking about um, when it, when an organism is having or when an individual is having an experience. There's something that it's like for it. What what does that mean? Uh, the individual has a property, the property of being phenomenally conscious or state conscious, and other some theorists I think have have been moving in that direction. Um, I uh, I think Jeff speaks. Um, has a paper where he says we should stop talking about consciousness as being a property of states and instead talk about it as a property of individuals. Um, Martina Nita Rumelin, I think, also has a paper where she argues something along these lines. So I think that that maybe that's one way to go. Um, but I've actually more recently, um, I'm, I'm currently working on a paper with jo Joseph Gottlieb. Do you, do, you, do you know, Joe? I don't think so. Uh, the, it, the name does kind of ring a bell. He's another... Um, I would say he's, you know, uh, David inspired, but wasn't around the grad center. Um, okay. so, uh, but yeah, but he's written a lot about uh, about high order views. He's he's not a, he doesn't like outwardly endorse them, but he's definitely like drawn to them. You know, at least thinks they're on the table. 
um, and has he's defended in some work some interesting like variants of that higher order view. So he's got like a view about that the higher order state's not a thought; it's a kind of uh, like a map like rep representation. But anyway, but he's drawn to higher order views, and we're working on a paper right now together, trying to articulate kind of what higher order views hold. And we, we, we've come, he's he he came up with a distinction, so I want to give him the credit. But an interesting distinction, which I think really helps make sense of kind of one thing I want to say. What I want to say here is about these empty hot cases is we should distinguish the property of consciousness. So the property um, of a state's being conscious from the state that is predicated by that property. So we, what we call the identity reading of consciousness and the of conscious state and the predicative reading of conscious state. I'm not following this at all. Could you? So let me, so, let me, so, so like, so just in a nutshell, so like think on, the, on an analogy with uh, with color. So um, the color, like if something has the property of being red, um, the property of redness is not itself red. It makes an object red. That makes oh. Sense? oh, right. Yes. Um, Unless and you're so, Plato. Right. Well, yeah. Exactly. If, 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 for Plato is all about property self-predicating. Right. Yeah. So maybe redness, according to Plato, is 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 itself red. Um, but but, uh, but no, I'm not Platonic in that sense. Okay. So if, yeah, if we deny that, um, then what what I'm thinking is we can. There's like a sort of a variant of Richard's view, which is I I want to say the higher order state is the property of consciousness. So it's like redness. It's not itself conscious. It's not phenomenally conscious. But it makes it predicates a state which is predicatively conscious. And that predicative state is the state that it appears to you that you're in. So when we, so there's two ways that we use conscious state. One way we could be saying the state, the property of consciousness in virtue of which there's consciousness. And the and there's another use of conscious state, which on the higher order view is just the apparent state. Okay. It's the content of the hot. I think I'm following this now. Okay. I mean, this is not something we publish. We're sort of working on this right now. Um, and so that's a way of avoiding saying that phenomenal and state consciousness come apart um, because the state that's state conscious is the state that it appears to you that you're in. And that state is also phenomenally conscious in the predicative sense. Um, but you don't need to be in that state, right? The only state you need to be in, the only actual existing state you need to be in is the higher order state because that's the property <laughs> of consciousness, but it's not itself conscious. So let me pivot to a slightly different problem before we shift gears altogether and talk sure. about quality space theory. Um, so back to this issue about whether consciousness is relational versus yeah. uh, not relational. One, um, one source for thinking that maybe it needs to be relational is thinking about the relationship between the unconscious and the conscious hmm. and um, arguably there are situations in which you have one in the same state of a person that is at one time not conscious and at a, another time it is conscious. So yeah. one sort of example is an example that often gets discussed in trying to make intuitive just the basic theory, uh, uh, the higher thought theory. So, so um, you're talking to somebody and their behavior is very angry they seem angry the way that the way they're moving their body their verbal behavior is very angry and you point it out to them because they're your friend or your partner and you know um you don't want them to to be angry and if they are angry you want to find out why so you ask them something like well why are you so angry and initially they deny that they're angry i'm not angry what are you talking about and then they hear them their own voice and it dawns on them that yes they are angry they have been angry um, and maybe you can get into some fine grained stuff about how to count states of anger. Yeah. But at least one plausible way of describing what's going on here is there's a state of anger that initially was not conscious. They weren't consciously angry and then they became conscious of their anger. It's the same state that is at one time an unconscious state and at another time it's a conscious state and it looks like the most straightforward way of describing what's going on here is one that would comport best with the relational reading 
of the higher thought theory of consciousness. You've got this first order state, which is the anger state. And then this higher order thought comes on the scene. And it's in virtue of this relation that the first order state goes from being unconscious anger to being conscious anger. So that looks, that looks like it's, you got to say something relational there. Um, and, and, you know, so I've heard Josh Weisberg, at least in conversation, flirt with a kind of disjunctive theory, whereby in some case, just like in disjunctive theories of perception, when they're dealing with the argument from illusion, you say something like, in some cases, you've got these perception or perception like states that are relational that involve a relation to stuff in the external world. You've got other cases in which there isn't the external relatum. And so what unifies this category, the category being perception like is this disjunction. Um, and so, you know, maybe say, yeah, sure. In some cases there is a, like, it is a relational thing that's going on. In other cases, it's not a relational thing that's going on. And then the super category, which is the, you know, what's going on with consciousness is going to be a disjunctive theory. Yeah, I'm, I'm reluctant to go that way. I mean, I, I think that's setting up, like, if you, if you will, like the problem of consciousness, like what's the central question that a theory of consciousness is trying to answer? I think one way in which it's often set out, which invites a relational view, which I think is ultimately question begging is, you know, um, what is it that makes a state that is unconscious? What makes that very state become conscious? Right. What what needs to be added to that very state for it to be con and so of course you've got all these first order theories where like oh it's got to enter the global workspace or it's got to be suitably informationally integrated or whatever it's got to be a state that your state that you're aware of stuff with like if you're Dretsky. Um, uh, and then of course there's a kind of high order version you know that of that which is well you just add a high order state that's directed at that state. And I think that that sounds natural, um, and so I understand the reason why, you know, but I think that there's a kind of more neutral way of putting the central question of consciousness, um, which doesn't beg the question against um, non-relational views, which is just what's the difference between an unconscious state, like subliminally seeing something or being, being unconsciously angry, and an experience of seeing something or, uh, you know, the experience of anger, or its conscious counterpart, if you prefer. Um, and that doesn't, in, th that doesn't make the assumption that what's happening is you've got some state and it's got some property that it's kind of taking on or, or and, you know, it's either got it or it doesn't have it. It's either being targeted by a higher order state or it's globally available or whatever you want to say. And Richard and I, in one of our papers, we call this that assumption that you've got to have something like that. And you've got to frame the problem like that, the experiential property assumption. And we just think there's just no motivation for it. Um, so in your case, you know, you've got your buddy shows up, they're angry, but they don't know that they're angry. And then you're like, dude, are you angry? And he's consciously angry. I, here's a neutral way of describing that case. You know, they were unconsciously angry, then they're consciously angry. What's the difference? And here's the difference that um, after you called his attention to it, he became aware that he was, he became aware of himself as being angry. And that doesn't imply that there was anything like added to the state of anger. It's true that the state of anger, the first order state of anger probably didn't change. In fact, here's, I mean, here's an argument, there's a zillion arguments, I think, against relational views. For one thing, I think that they just lead into empty hot problems, which are intractable. But setting that aside, I mean, how could a relational higher order theory work? I mean, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Like, what is a higher order theory? What is a higher order thought, which is just supposed to be a thought? What is it doing to the first order state? I mean, think about just other stuff. Like, you know, I'm aware of you, Pete, right now. Like, I'm having a thought about you right now. Like, I'm thinking Pete's great. That's not doing anything to you. I mean, I guess we're in a relation, but like, well, no actually, I feel really good that you said that. Oh, okay, but, <laughs> but I, I don't want to. But yeah, that misses my argument, Pete. <laughs> I'm not a counterexample. Yeah, but I you, get you your get, point. Yeah, you get my point that there's no like transfer of a property, um, and it's not even clear how that could work. And so that is yet more reason to think that what what you know having experience or there being something like or whatever term you want to use you know being a, being a conscious state is just is it, all you need is the appearance the you know the the it's seeming to you that you're in the state um which is the non-relational way of putting things does that make sense it does make sense also you you might be about uh, about to fall into my deviously constructed trap uh oh um, <laughs> probably <laughs> But also we're at the point where I need to insert a break into the okay. conversation. Do you need a real break? 
I'm good. So let's call this the break. Okay. Um, welcome back from the break, everybody. So we were talking about whether higher order thought theory is a relational theory or not. Um, and, and I think the way that you characterize it is the right way to go that, um, you know, like, what, why should we think of uh, these first order targets as like something happening to them? Um, you know, why not just think of higher order thought? Uh, uh, sorry, why not just think of consciousness in terms of how things seem to me with respect to my mental states? The higher order thoughts explain all of that uh, by themselves. That's, that seems perfectly fine to me. But now I want to talk to you about quality space theory. Okay. In, and in so far, if any of this turns into a trap, the trap is something like, well, what do you need the quality? The, 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 what do you need all that for, given all, all this about higher thoughts? But yeah. independently of whether there's a trap or not, or you know, whether that's a problem, it's just interesting um, on, on its own. Um, so why, let's, get, let's get into it. Let's talk about quality space theory, what it is. Really? I've, got some, uh, I've got some questions for you, but why don't you say a little bit about what it is? Yeah, so um, quality space theory, as I understand it, um, is another view that's you know that was pioneered by by Rosenthal. Um, although there are other theorists that have you know views that are in the the ballpark of it, but the version that I try to defend in my work is like very similar to Rosenthal's, if not just Rosenthal's view. Um, and it's supposed to be an account of a certain kind of property of sensory or qualitative states. The way that David puts it is, it's a theory of what he calls mental qualities, which are qualitative properties of states like perceptual states and emotional states and so forth, qualitative states. Um, because Rosenthal and I think that those kinds of states can all occur unconsciously, um, uh, this commits at least David's way of putting things to there being unconscious qualities, um, which I'm fine with. <laughs> um, we can talk about it. Although in some, in some of my work, one way that I try to like soften the weirdness of that is by saying that really all we're talking about is a kind of representation. So um, as I read quality space theory, it's an account of a certain kind of representation that figures in, for example, perceptual states and emotional states, which is distinct from the kinds of representations, di distinct from the kinds of conceptual representations that typically figure, for example, in thoughts or desires. Um, and so what's the, what's the rough idea? So the rough idea is, you know, you're uh, you're in a sensory state like a, a visual sensation of red. Um, what is that state? And what quality space theory says is, um, sen sensory states fall into discrete families. Um, so, for example, visual sensory states seem to fall into uh, a family of um, uh, of basically states that are directed at the colors. Um, how do we get a handle on those? So. We just start with a creature's ordinary uh, sensory or perceptual discriminatory behavior. So we, we take a creature, we give them a bunch of color chips, and we say, order up these color chips um, in terms of how they seem to you to be, or not in terms of how they seem to you, but you know, order them up in terms of how you're able to discriminate them from one another. And there's lots of different techniques for doing this. But for example, you can make them just make J and D judgments, uh, just noticeable difference judgments. So you give them you know, two different color chips, and you say, like, can you tell these apart or not? And the creature says, I can't tell them apart. So you put those in the same spot. You show them two other you know, color chips, two shades of red. And the creature says, oh, those are different. And so you put them in slightly different spots. And if you do this over and over again with bazillions of color chips, you'll get the organism to the creature to um, generate a space that shows all the similarity and difference relations that hold between the colors as they're able to be discriminated by the organism. Um, so in the case of the colors, for example, um, that'll give you a three-dimensional um, color solid that shows all the relationships between the different colors. So the reds will be all near each other and they'll be closer to the oranges uh, than they'll be to say the greens. Um, and I say it's three dimensional because you need to figure out some set of dimensions that are gonna capture math, you know, capture the relationships that hold between the, the colors as they're discriminated. And typically, you know, color science, visual vision scientists think that those differ along the, the dimensions of hue, saturation and brightness. And you can do this for any sensible property uh, you know, um, accessed by any sensible sensory modality. So for example, you could do it with the sounds as accessed by audition or the tastes as accessed by gustation or smells, you know, that you smell, I mean, odors that you smell. And this generates different spaces of, of sensible stimuli, perceptible stimuli. 
Um, so you could have all the odors ordered up in terms of how the order, however the odors are ordered. And I know that Rosenthal and Ben Young and Andreas Keller have a paper where they're like, it's a potential like gazillion, you know, <laughs> a lot of dimensions. Um, and this creates this like incredibly complicated multidimensional space. Okay. But so the, but the central insight of the view, as far as I understand it, is in order for a creature to be engaging in these kinds of discriminatory behaviors that are captured by having this space, they need to be able to be in, in states, sensory states that differ in the same, in, in ways that mirror the ways in which the sensible properties differ. So if I'm making discriminations between red and, you know, different shades of red and red and orange and red and green, I need to be able to be in states that also di differentially differ from one another uh, in ways that mirror the ways that those properties differ. And so what, what we say is there's the space of actual sensible properties in the world, like the space of colors. And we extrapolate from that and say, we can also describe different uh, uh, variable states of the organism as sitting in a space of states of the organism that match the um, geometry of the sensible properties that the organism is able to discriminate. So you've got two spaces. You've got a space of the sensible properties like the colors and a space of the sensory states like the visual experience, visual sensations of color. And they have matching geometries because the mental one is literally just extrapolated from the geometry of the sensible one. And so what you get is a one-to-one -one mapping of mental, uh, of, of uh, sensory states um, to sensible properties. So uh, the mental, you know, a visual experience, uh, visual sensation of red occupies a location within this space of sensory states that matches the location of um, perceptible red in the space of colors. Um, and so that's, that's roughly the idea is you have these two spaces. That doesn't mean that there's a space in my head, right? There's no like space of sensory states in my head. This is just a, a model. It's a way of describing different kinds of states that I could be in. And so if you wanna ask, you know, what is it for me to, to sense red? It's for me to be in a, in a state that occupies this location in this model that, that matches the location of red in the space of colors. And the sort of small twist, I mean, I don't even know if it's a twist, the, the small uh, emendation that I've made in my work to the way that David puts it is, and David says, look, it's natural to think that these mental representation, that these mental qualities are representations, because after all, the whole point of positing them is to explain why organisms are able to make the discriminations that they make. And the most natural explanation of how they make those discriminations is that these states represent the sensible properties that they're discriminating. And so my addition is that what I want to say is these are just a certain kind of, con it's, a state, it's a theory of content um, that uh, explains what sensory contents are in terms of their um, lo locations in these, uh, in these quality spaces that mirror the locations of the perceptible property quality spaces. Um, so it gives you a kind of theory of mental content, which is very different than typical theories of mental content, like any theory that explains conceptual content. Um, you know, which we can talk about. Um, so that's that's the nutshell. Does that uh, that give enough to you and our, our listeners? Yeah, I think that that's that's wonderful. Um, and one thing I definitely want to make sure that we talk about is the holism part of this. Yeah, because my hunch is that there's a lot in consciousness studies that you could solve with the holism, uh, in yeah. particular. Uh, it's my suspicion for the past couple of years that Mary goes away if you're properly holistic about this stuff. So, hmm. uh, but but let's uh, save that for a little bit later. Um, okay. Some things I want to ask you about just the basic the basic idea uh, includes this question. So um, to make sure I'm getting this right, suppose there were two paint chips that I could discriminate with respect to say hue or one of the other three dimensions of differences between colors. If there are two paint chips that I, uh, that I can discriminate, or if there's two paint chips that my dog can discriminate, it follows then that there must be two different states my dog can get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that yeah. so far so good? Yeah. And suppose there's two paint chips that I can't discriminate, or maybe it's my dog who can't discriminate them. Um, the, it, but we are quite sure the dog can see them it's not like the dog just like walks right into them or anything like that yeah. all the evidence that you could hope for that the dog sees them is present but no evidence that they see any difference between them 
-hmm. would, would you say then that the dog is in the same state or is that yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it follows, but I do think it's like a be the best explanation or a natural explanation is that they're in the same state, yeah. Because that that claim that there has to be the same state, then that gets you into trouble with phenomenal sororities. Because you could come up with these situations where there's a failure of discrimination. Um, and, and if a failure of discrimination of things that are visible means you're just yeah. in the same state, then it would follow that as you march all the way down to the end of the sorority series, you'd still be in the same state. Yeah. But that seems ridiculous because you can make the change be, you know, as big as the, the change from highly saturated green to highly saturated red. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I do have a, like a try at a response to this worry um, in my paper about color that came out somewhat recently. Um, which I'm just, I'm, I'm basically just reaching again for a point that David makes, um, which is, um, it's not simply that the organism can discriminate, you know, can't discriminate the two uh, properties of, or, or two color chips if presented at the same time, because you're right that that would result in sorties kinds of problems. Um, you might need additional um, techniques to show that there are conditions under which the organism would be able to distinguish them, right? Um, so I, I, I think I, I borrow this terminology. I, I think it's from Austin Clark between what you might call like local indiscriminability and global indiscriminability. So there's a sense in which if chip A and chip B are indiscriminable and chip B and chip C are indiscriminable, but chip A and chip C are indiscriminable, or sorry, are discriminable. So that's the sorties case. What I want to say is A and B are locally indiscrimin indiscriminable, B and C are locally indiscriminable, A and C are locally discriminable, but because they're locally discriminable and have this relationship to, uh, to B, that makes A and B globally discriminable from one another, though they're locally indiscriminable. Does that make sense? I and believe so. so. But I'm also simultaneously thinking of eight million other things. So okay. it's possible. <laughs> so, <laughs> all, all of them are objections to what you're saying. So um, okay. Well, but, but anyway, it's, it's basically it's a way of saying that there are if you were to find a case like that, we would have reason to put A and B in different locations in the space, despite the fact that there are conditions under which you couldn't tell them apart. Right. So it's not simply that under some like, you know, when you present them right next to each other, you can't tell them apart, that puts them in the same location. It's that if you, if there are things that they're discriminable from, that if there's, if there's something that A is discriminable from, but B is um, not discriminable from, then they have to get different locations. They're globally discriminable from one another, even if they're locally indiscriminable. And so they get different locations. So another thing I wanted to ask, and this is just kind of at the details level, making sure I get the details right. Um, there, there's a way I hear the quality space theory that has a lot of like theoretical meat to it. Like I think it does commit you to certain things uh, going on in the head in a certain sort of way. Uh, and I just want to run that by you because at one point you denied some kind of strong commitment to what's going on in the, in the head. Um, but anyway, the, the way I generally interpret the theory is that it is committed to there being a series of states inside the discriminating organism and the, the the states bear relations of resemblance and similarity to each other that aren't exactly the same relations of similarity and difference as the discriminated properties but nonetheless they, they, are, exactly. they, they aren't so yeah. uh, there's like they might be states of my nervous system yeah uh and nothing in my ner nervous system is bright green Right. Um, and, and even if it yeah. were, it wouldn't make yeah. sense to say that I have states that are bright green, but let's yeah. just, you know, yeah. let's pick bright green. The, my brain is in no way bright green. Um, yet I'm able to discriminate all these different shades, all of which are some shade or other of bright green. Yeah. Nothing in my brain is bright green. Nonetheless, my brain states um, are, you know, maybe it's states of activation. Uh, where you're, you're, you've got something like um, spiking frequencies, mm -hmm. right? And you could order the spiking frequencies in a way and talk about like this one being greater than that one. And this one is even 
more greater than this third one. And, and that set of relations will bear a second order isomorphism to the discriminated properties. So even though the, the brain states don't have a, a greener than relation, they have a higher spiking frequency relation. And, and the, these two structures, one of them is a set of things in the environment and relations defined over those things. The other is a set of states, maybe in my maybe in my nervous system, maybe in my Martian foot bladder. But anyway, right. some, some, somehow there's yeah. things inside me yeah. that, that are have this structural relation to the things that are outside of me, even yeah. though they don't have the first order resemblance of the things in here being bright green, right. just like the things out there are. Uh, is, is that, at least uh, uh, to you, is that agreeable? Or is that now building more into the theory than I, you want to commit to? I do think it is building more into the, because the theory, like it's, it, it's like through and through functionalist. And so what I want to say is the colors, strictly speaking, which we'll let's focus on color, the colors, strictly speaking, like resemble and different, differ from one another. The mental states, the sense, the sensations, and, you know, it, to, Rosenthal sort of following this like Solarzian way of doing things like, you know, puts like a star so he, he, he's comfortable with saying that they're, that they're qualitative. They're not qualitative in the same way that the sensor, sensory proper, the sensible properties are. They're not red, but they're red star. Yeah. Um, uh, and so uh, the, those, that, that's purely a functional notion. And so red star does resemble star, um, orange star more than it resembles green star. And that just is to say that functionally speaking, that state whatever its neurological underpinnings or whatever its, you know, its physical realizer is, uh, occupies this functional location in the map of sensible sensory states um, that maps onto red. Um, and so I don't want to say that there's any predictions about the physical states, qua physical states having to resemble or, or there be any ordering of them. Like, I don't know, I guess it's conceivable that like, a really fast firing rate could be, you know, compatible with the state or realizes the state that enables me to discriminate red. A really slow one um, is what enables me to discriminate orange and something in between is what enables me to discriminate green. I mean, it'd be weird if we were built that way. That's but interesting. Compatible with the view that I'm suggesting. So, um, you know, uh, Gallistel, see, uh, who is that? Uh, I'm blanking on, on everything but their last name. You know Gallus still, right? Sure, Randy Gallus, yeah, yeah. And I forgot the big book, uh, the, uh, but it, it, he's like he's capital letter C period Randy Gallus still. Is, okay, isn't it C Randy Gallus? Anyway, yeah. he's got this big book called like the structure of representation or something. Uh huh. Early in in that book, um, he talks about these different representational schemes. One of which he calls nominal representations. A mm -hmm. model of nominal representations would be like numbers uh on jerseys of football players okay um other kinds of representations which you might i forgot gallistel's terminology but you might say is more like um analog representations of the sort you see and say a thermometer you've got right. various heights of a th thermometer's mercury column each of the individual heights represent individual temperatures but further, there's this relationship between heights. It's the greater than or the taller than relationship. And that relationship just maps onto the hotter than relationship. Mm -hmm. So in the thermometer case, it's not like the football player case. With the football player case, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a set of numbers or numerals and a set of football players. And that's it. There isn't a relationship between the numbers that itself carries any sort of significance. It's not like we're reserving the biggest numbers for the tallest players or the most valuable players. There's no significance to the size of the number or any other relationships between the numbers. It's just a one-to-one -one, and it's called nominal because it's literally like just names. Right. Um, but in the temperature case, you've got isomorphisms or homomorphisms where there isn't just a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements, but there's a relationship that you can define over the elements in the one set. And then that relation maps onto the, the relation in the other set. So what yeah. you're saying is that no, nominal representation is fine. You don't need this extra 
yeah. thing that, that would give you full-blown homomorphisms or uh, isomorphisms in the sense that there's a relationship between the states in the creature that somehow mirrors, for example, the, the greener than relation or the more saturated or darker than relation. It's only at the functional level that they have those relationships. It's in virtue of the properties that yeah. they enable discrimination standing in more, you know, darker than or lighter than relations that explain that is what those what it is for those states to stand in darker star or lighter than star relations. Yeah. So I get into this issue a little bit in a paper I co-authored with Mike Collins, another CUNY <laughs> grad center guy. Uh, and um we make the point that it, probably it would be a miracle if, if in these sorts of cases you had strictly nominal representations. And the, and the way I would put the point today, because you brought up the whole thing about families of properties, that for example, like, you know, you don't just, dis, di, like mother nature didn't give you the ability to, to, to detect just a single color. Right. There's a whole family of colors and a whole family of, ways in which colors differ from each other yeah and um and that kind of makes sense like once you have a mechanism that is able to causally respond to colors you have a mechanism that with just minor variations like yeah. for example just increasing the activity or decreasing it you now are able to represent a whole uh family um to try to build something that represents in strictly this nominal way without any meaningful relationships between the states of representation uh, is in theory possible, but like really hard and expensive to pull off. And also, also one might say that like my, on my interpretation, which it has this extra stuff built in, you get an explanation of why you, there would be families. I mean, I should say like, I don't, I don't guess that I don't, if I'm understanding what's what, what you're saying, I don't have any problem with any of that. I just don't think that it's built into the theory. Like, oh, okay, yeah. So I guess it's it's cons it's consistent with it that there'd be something about the organization of the physical things where the states, you know, do have some magnitude that explain that is ordered in the same way that the states are or you know ordered at the nominal level. That's consistent with the theory. I'm fine with that. I'm just saying it makes no prediction that it gotcha. would be. Yeah. So okay. And so maybe it's a miracle. Maybe maybe you're right that it would be miraculous if it had no connection. Um, I don't have a view about that. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so shifting gears, to, but still focusing on quality space theory. One thing I wanted to ask you about is something I attempted to ask David Rosenthal about many years ago. And um, I love David Rosenthal, but I bet you can relate to this experience. You, you try to run something by Rosenthal and his reaction is something like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Just like. I have no not, idea what you're talking about, Pete. Like not, not that that's a bad objection or that it, you know, it has an error, but it can't even be understood. <laughs> <laughs> what he, which is demoralizing. Uh, but anyway, so here's the thing I tried to press him about, about uh, quality space theory. So there's a way of hearing quality space theory whereby it's this holistic theory. It's yeah. functionalistic and holistic in the way that functionalistic theories are holistic. Um, what defines an, a state is its relation to all these other possible states. It doesn't, it doesn't count as a state which is red star uh all by itself it's in virtue of these other you know the the dark dark red star and green star all that set of relations that makes it what it is and so for example um if there were say uh a creature who had say tetrachromaticity it would be able to make all sorts of color discriminations that you and I can't make. I'm assuming you're not tetrachromatic, Jake. I hope you're not offended. I wish I... Are uh, the resulting, as is typical with these kind of holistic schemes, the, the resulting spaces would be incommensurate. It really wouldn't make sense to say that, for example, I mean, there's certain birds are tetrachromatic. In some yeah. sense, they don't see red. Yeah. 
there, there's another sense in which like, well, there's a red thing. You and I can see it as red and obviously they can see it. So there's some sense in which it can see red, but it's in virtue of the fact that it has this four dimensional color space, right? Whatever sensation it has in response to that thing is going to be a, individuated differently. And it's the same kind of incommensurability problem you get in say philosophy of science, when you're mm -hmm. trying to compare Kuhnian paradigms yep. or in, uh, the philosophy of mental content where, you know, do you and I mean the same thing by assassin? Yeah. If I believe that someone could survive a successful assassination attempt and you don't believe that, right. do you really mean the same thing by assassin on yeah. a holistic uh, way of thinking of these things? So anyway, this is just a setup to the point of the, the try to thing I was uh, wanting to press Rosenthal about. Right. What I asked Rosenthal uh, <clears throat> is, are the discriminations that one can make consciously the same discriminations one can make unconsciously or vice versa? Or in other words, is it possible that there are things that you can uh, discriminate consciously, but not unconsciously or, or vice versa? Mm -hmm. And to that, he said, yes. And then I said, well, isn't that a problem? W wouldn't that be a problem, for example, uh, in the claim that these qualities, I say, while gesturing towards all my, you know, red stars, all my color stars, these could occur unconsciously. Yeah. Wouldn't you, on uh, this uh, holism, if you, if you think that you get different profiles of discrimination behavior in the conscious and unconscious conditions, wouldn't yeah. then you'd be forced to say that it's directly analogous to the thing we were saying about the tetrachromatic bird? Yeah, it, the colors we see and the colors it sees can't be the same colors. Similarly, the qualities that uh, I experience unconsciously can't be the same as the ones I experience consciously. Mm -hmm. And that's when Rosenthal said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Jake, are you going to say that you have no idea what I'm talking no, about? I I think I, I think I know what you're talking about. So, I mean, I, 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 let me say a bunch of things. I don't know if it actually means I understand what you're talking about. Uh, um, but uh, no, if I mean, you I, don't I, understand what I'm talking about. That's fine. I won't. No, I think I, I think I do. And I think, and look, even though you and I have different conceptual schemes, I'm a conceptual semantics person and think that we probably do mean we, there's a sense in which we mean slightly different things about by assassin. And there's a sense in which we mean the same thing. Um, and I think that we can capture that even on holistic views of mental content, um, either on the conceptual side or on what I'm calling this like non-conceptual side. So like, how do we do that? Like, th let's think on the conceptual side, just as, a, as an example, like, you know, you, you and I draw slightly different inferences about what, what assassin, like how assassin works, or like, you know, we draw different inferences, like with thoughts about assassins. And so if you think that what makes a, a state have the content that it does is it's like inferential profile, right? Your disposition to make different inferences, then sh there's a strict sense in which you and I have different thoughts about assassins when we think them. Like we don't even like, we don't even have the same concept. Um, but I feel like, it, I think, so I, I address this objection in some of my papers and I think I quote or cite a paper by Churchland. Doesn't he have something along these lines on the conceptual side of things where he says like- Look, Yeah, I was gonna bring it up yeah. be before you mentioned it. Uh, yeah, he definitely, you know, if you if you embed what you're talking about in this kind of connectionist framework, yeah, then you can you can introduce these metrics whereby you can meaningfully say like, well, this conceptual scheme is more similar to this conceptual scheme yeah. than another, and that would and and there's other Churchland papers where he talks about basically quality space theory, yeah, and you could fit that into this connectionist framework also. So you now, might not, you, it might not work for you on about concepts because, you know, it, but Churchill has already committed to a certain way of thinking about concepts whereby there's not a big difference between conceptual stuff and non-conceptual stuff. In, yeah. in, in some sense, it's all non-conceptual. Right. It's just these states of, of neural networks for which you could define these similarities across different networks or di across different persons. So I don't really want to go the full Churchland way, but I take the sort of lesson is that there's a sense in which we can compare different networks of relations and describe them as roughly similar. Um, and so that you and I use assassins slightly different differently um, 
it's not enough for us to, for any practical purpose we'd say we're using the same concept like it has the same rough location in our nodes of inferences that for all for all practical purposes we would never notice that we're not using it the same however i think there's a value in in holding that there's a way in which you know maybe to some extent there is like a technical sense in which we're meeting different things because after all you and i could like come to this kind of point where we're confused with each other how, how can you think that you know you can survive an assassin an assassination attempt and then now now we're at the place where our conceptual schemes rub against each other and like it now it does look kind of like we're using the term differently and so i think there's a practical sense in which we can compare different you know inferential networks but, but strictly speaking they are slightly different and i think the same kind of thing can be said on the qualitative side of things um when it comes to tetrachromatic birds or whatever um i mean there's there's some difficult questions about exactly how we want like which space we want to consider to be like the space um but basically what i would say is it's it's the largest space that can be constructed by or across organisms of roughly the same kind and so if birds discriminate a few colors more than we do but not like a ton ton more and not in all kinds of wild crazy ways then i would say they can just see more of the color their color space is slightly larger than ours um just like you might be able you maybe you're more erudite than me and be able to draw more inferences than i can um but nonetheless we're able to sort of like jigger my color space onto their color space to be able to make comparisons to say actually we are you know roughly seeing the same color um or it might be that their space is so wildly different than ours like you know one thing i consider in some papers is like you could imagine you know stealing this example from adam pow it's like you could imagine an organism that's like totally different than us organizes the colors up and the colors and the, the perceptible colors in all sorts of different ways and in those cases i don't think it's weird to say that yeah they're seeing the colors in completely different ways i don't even think it's weird to say in that kind of a case that they're not even seeing colors anymore like maybe maybe we need to come up with a different notion of like visually available property um to describe what they're doing because that because you know they're gonna be so bizarre they're gonna be saying oh look at this tomato it's like it looks a lot more like this lime than it does like this strawberry and you know why would they be doing that if they were seeing colors right um it's evocative of frank jackson's fred right the uh, the forgotten character from the mary paper mary got all the press and everyone forgets about fred yeah but, poor fred. but fred is able to see colors that we can't see right and um, anyway, I'm mostly just trying to segue into Mary okay. by bringing this up. But we're, we're getting pretty crunched for time. Uh -oh. um, I can't believe this has just been whizzing by. This has been a really great conversation. I wish we had more time to conduct we'll do it. Again sometime, Pete. But here's the Mary thought. Yeah, okay. If you look at standard cases of, of Mary, the colorblind so scientist who supposedly doesn't know what it's like to see red, even though she's read all these books about it, yeah, the books were in black and white. Um, my hunch about people's intuitions about that case is they're assuming basic humanism mm. about our our color ideas or our, our color uh, sensations, whereby um, red is atomic. Yeah, for things that are holistic, and I think this is the same kind of holism that you're talking about. Yeah. for things that are holistic like for example hume's missing shade of blue right what it is to be that shade of blue is something that relates to other shades of blue it uh it relates to other uh things that of the same shade but aren't blue yep um people don't have the same intuition that, that you have to have seen that shade of blue to know in advance what that shade of blue is going to be like exactly as i'm hearing the, your holistic interpretation of quality spaces is giving you this family of representations that are individuated in a holistic way throughout there's none of them that you could say these are the atomistic ones out of which you build these more complex ones it seems to me that everything then is like i mean everything that's sensible everything that can be sensed is on a par with the the shade of blue the, that you could come up with a scenario where mary hasn't experienced it yet but since it's not atomic there's no bar from her knowing ahead of time what it's going to be like yeah i i the, exactly and i if, you know david rosendahl has a paper called um there's nothing there's nothing that it's like to be mary or, there, or there's there's nothing about mary um which is a hilarious title which i think um i think i came up with it actually um but uh, 
But yeah, uh, where you argue something along these lines that basically, yeah, when you're thinking about color holistically in this way, um, it's that's our third personal account of color experience. And so there's it's not mysterious at all that she would be able to come to know what red is like without having seen it. I remember reading that paper when it first came out, uh, yeah. but then I must have forgotten it because it feels like I'm, you know, and how philosophy seems, goes. It's obvious now, yeah. <laughs> I got to go back and reread it and see if he's yeah. making the point specifically about holism. I don't remember how much he pushes the holism because I also read it yeah. a while ago. But um, but yeah, we should go both, both back and read that. And then Eagle, I've got, I've got a reading list now. Um, and yeah, definitely. And another thing that you get with this holistic view is not just a solution to Mary, but a solution to like inverted qualia, mm -hmm. right? Because with these complex spaces, if they're asymmetrical, there's no remapping. Right. And if there's no remapping, then there's no inversions. Right. And, and they can't be symmetrical, like, because they're generated on the basis of discriminatory behavior. And so right. it, if, it, 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 if they're started by how they're discriminated, there's no place for, there's no way for an organism to be like, well, I could put it here or I could put it here and it doesn't matter. Right. 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 It doesn't happen. And these are points that, that I know Rosenthal has made, but I, not sure off the top of my head where he makes them, but I do recall him talking specifically about discriminability and, and qualia inversions. Yeah. And then once you kill qualia inversions, like zombies are dead. Yeah. Because because when you see like why there wouldn't be qualia inversions, what you see is how functionalist this stuff all is. Yep. Um, so we have, or, or someone, someone from CUNY <laughs> has solved the heart problem. Maybe it was I us. It, I think it was well, Rosenthal says it was it was Lewis, but um, but yeah, uh, David Lewis. David Lewis, yeah. About the which point the the discriminate well about functionalism about functionalism about the mind and how that basically if everything is functionalist through and through you don't get zombies. Oh right, right, right. Yeah. So sure. Yeah. Type well, yeah. If type A physicalism is true, of course, game yeah. over. Game over. Um, so we're, uh, we're like seven minutes away from being completely out of time. Okay. Uh, is there, um, did you want me to say about the lurking objection about if the higher order states are just, you know, making me have apparent states and what do you need mental qualities for to begin with? Oh, thanks for reminding me. Yeah. What do you need? What do you need the mental qualities for anyway? Like if two, two, two things at least. Um, so one thing is that they're, they're, when they're actually instantiated or when they have to be instantiated is that they're, they're features of first order states and the first order states like so it's a typical objection or it's a it's an objection people have raised to higher reviews which is like if you think if you're a non-relational higher earth theorist what do you need the first order states for to begin with but the higher order the conscious states are posited to explain things like your reports that you see read um and your you know the phenomenology or whatever but it's not supposed to be explaining like for example your discriminatory behavior um the fact that it seems to me that I see red isn't going to explain why I discriminate red from blue. That I need to actually see red and blue, right? I don't, I can't, the appearance of my seeing red or blue is not gonna explain, is not gonna explain what seeing red or blue is gonna explain. Fair enough. Like if you, if, if what we care about is a full theory of the mind or full theory of behavior, sure, quality exactly. spaces have earned their keep. But, so, but I want a, pers a version of this, this just focused on consciousness yeah do we need if for explaining consciousness what if anything do quality spaces do for us well you need to explain the contents of the higher order thoughts you need to explain what what is the higher order state representing right and um in the case of perceptual states for example what what it is to think to yourself that you're seeing red is to think to yourself that you're in a state that has mental red um, it's not to think to yourself that you're in a state that has red, right? Because it doesn't, right? As you pointed out, your you know brain isn't neon green. Um, and I guess you could try to cash it out as I'm in a state that represents red or something like that, or puts me in contact with red. Um, but that's just what mental red is. Um, it's the state that puts you in the appropriate kind of sensory contact with red. 
Um, and we just don't think about, you know, sensory contact or sensible representation. These are all, you know, technical notions that are not in folk psychology. So that's not the way we think about ourselves. We think about ourselves in our folk psychological terms. And one of the folk psychological concepts we have is of our me mental qualities. Um, so that's the, now that isn't the actual mental quality playing, you know, a role. That's the representation of a mental quality playing a role. Um, but that, but if you you know if you push this object, objection far enough, you could ask you know what do I need first order contents for, right? You know first order conceptual contents like the you know the thought that there's a piano in my office, um, right? What do you need those for? Because the, all I need in the higher estate is my thought that I'm thinking that there's a piano in the room, and that's you know not. That I, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite understanding your answer. Um, uh, so I'm asking from the point of view of co consciousness, what do we need? The first order stuff. Uh, I'm sorry. What do we need quality space theory for? And part yeah. of your answer was, well, we need it to explain the contents, co the contents of the higher thoughts. Yeah. By which you mean something along the lines of like an externalist theory of content, whereby like you know we need on twin Earth, we need something different by water because there's a different thing out there that caused our water tokenings. But on Earth, we mean that no, I'm stuff. Not I'm not thinking externalistically. I'm thinking like, so if I have a thought that I'm seeing red, what that is is what that really is is the thought that I'm in a state that you know I'm in a state that has mental red. So I need an account now. I need to tell you. So if 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 that's my account of what it is to have a conscious experience of red is to be in a state that represents me as being in mental red, even though I don't have to be in mental red, it'd be nice to know what would mental red be <laughs> or what, what what is mental red such that I can be aware of myself as having it. Oh, I see. What would, what would, what would make it true? Yeah. What would make it true? Gotcha. Yeah. Um, this, uh, I'm looking at the clock. I'm not going to be able to squeeze this in in our, our remaining minutes. Okay. Um, but it, but the quality space theory seems kind of elaborate, and it's mm. kind of hard to believe that the people that have a higher thought that they are seeing something red have something that elaborate. In well, they thought. don't have the theory. They don't have the theory. You know, they just have the thought. Like I'm in a. I mean, I don't think it's that complicated. Like the thought would be, I'm in a state that you know is kind of like this and not kind of like that. You know. Um. Okay, so they, so they have to have enough. They have to have some theory or other. It might not be the full theory. Yeah, but it's probably going to still be a theory that we would call a functional or or a holistic theory. That they they're not thinking of colors as these atomic properties. No, and I mean just think about how people ordinarily describe their color experiences. But you know, setting don't ask philosophers. What do you ask you? you ask somebody in you know your intro class what, what what's an experience of red like? They'll be like, oh, you know, it's kind of like orange. You know, it's yeah. not very much like blue. <laughs> right. You know, they describe color experiences comparatively, and that's even more clear in the case of, for example, taste or smell. Huh. Well, we're we're getting real close to the very very end, and there's okay. a whole bunch of stuff that we're just not going to have time to talk about. Like, for example, conceptualism. Yeah, versus I, I really do want to talk about conceptualism at some point because uh, actually Rosenthal and I are working on a paper right now uh, against conceptualism. No. Yeah. I'm a uh, you know me. Well, I'm, it's kind of it's in I'm it's a in conceptualist. We well, I know I know, it's 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 the view that um, perceptual states have both conceptual content and mental qualities. Um, so we're trying to like motivate that idea. Um, so I'd love to, like, I would love to talk to you more about these things. At some yeah. Point. Well, I would like you to have you come back and we could do a, a sequel episode. Sure. That sounds great. That'd be awesome. Also, we should talk to each other more often. I anyway, yeah, it's, been, it's been too long. Would you like to have a last word? Not really. Just thanks for listening, I guess. Well, um, well thank you so much. Don't, uh, please stay on. I'll say goodbye to you properly off the air. But okay. uh, but before I push the button, I want to say on the recording, that was excellent. And I look forward to listening to it because I think there's a lot uh, there to, to for me to soak in. That was very clarifying and helpful. Uh, and just, just interesting. So thank you very much, Jake. Sure, man. Thanks for having me. All right. So I'm going to push the button. Uh, here we go. Stopping the recording. <laughs>